So picture this, you're relaxing one day, watching Spider-Man 3, having the time of your life. You start to wonder when Spider-Man 4 will be coming out and then suddenly, Sony bursts into your room, slaps you across the face, whips out the amazing Spider-Man 2, slots it into your DVD player and forces you to watch it. Sound familiar? Well that's exactly what happened in 2012. Now the amazing Spider-Man movies have always been strange to me. I'm coming after you. They're not inherently awful movies, but rather the very definition of a mixed bag. Because on one hand you have Andrew Garfield, and on the other you have Payne. Garfield is undoubtedly a fantastic actor with a hairline that would make most bald men cry, and he clearly loves the character. I needed Spidey in my life when I was a kid and he gave me hope. But he's trapped in these weird films that were only created to keep the Spider-Man license, cause Sony would rather jump off a building than give it back to Marvel. Anyway, there's two of these lovely films, with the first one being about the giant lizard man attacking New York, trying to turn everyone into lizards, because, ah. Uh... And the second one being about Jamie Foxx getting dental work done by some electric eels. Now currently, it's pretty well regarded that both these movies aren't great, but the one saving grace they have is the incredibly sexy Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man. Besides that though, the first one was, Okay, I am not the werewolf. Despite the costume resembling a basketball, like Andrew is great, there's some really poignant moments, and of course, a great romance. I'm gonna throw you out the window now. <laughs> But overall, it wasn't anything special, and then the sequel broke into my house, cancelled my Netflix subscription, stole my wife, and pepper sprayed me. Oh, fuck you in my eye! Okay, that might be a slight exaggeration, but there's no way you can tell me TASM 2 was good. Luckily though, I'm not here to talk about the films, I'm here to talk about the games! Now typically, movie tie-in games are about as good as your mum's cooking, with only a few notable exceptions like Wolverine Origins, Enter the Matrix, Spider-Man 2, and B-Movie. The latter of which being forged in the pits of hell by Beanox. And because B-Movie redefined what it means to be a gamer, Beanox decided to have another crack at a movie tie-in game with The Amazing Spider-Man. Which normally would be setting off alarm bells in my head, but at this point Beanox have been making actual good Spider-Man games, with the absolute chad Shattered Dimensions and the decent edge of time, so I was cautiously optimistic that this game would at least give me my daily dose of serotonin. But then I found out the game was going to be open world and my synapses fired up. For the first time in like 4 years you are able to freely swing around a beautiful New York City and interact with all those lovely New Yorkers, meaning this game could potentially be the next Spider-Man 2. I'm gonna come. So you can imagine my excitement when I bought this game, and my disappointment when I actually played it. But first ad time. It's a new year and you've decided that you're going to try and achieve your goal of becoming a YouTuber, just like the funny Swedish man. But there's one problem, you don't know how to edit. Don't worry though, cause Skillshare is here to help. Join Skillshare right now and pick from a massive variety of excellent classes that will give you all the tools you need to try and grow your creative skills. Like for example, this class I took with a popular YouTube tech man. No, the uh, the other one. Which helped me learn to be more productive with my time so that I can finally upload a video this month. Teaching me valuable skills like how to write more engaging scripts and overall improving the quality of my content. Skillshare can also help you explore and find new passions and skills like taking great photos, painting beautiful pictures, cooking fabulous meals, or even how to start your own business. Not to mention the first 1000 people to use the link in the description will get a one month trial completely free. And imagine all the cool stuff you can create in a month. I mean I made this. Beautiful. Finally, with Skillshare helping you along the way, you can follow your dreams and make PewDiePie <laughs> cry by starting the YouTube channel you've always wanted to. Have fun getting demonetized. So the game begins with you sneaking into Oscorp, stealing the world's most top secret files from the CEO, Nathan Drake, discovering that he's turning these wholesome animals into furries. How could you be so cruel, Mr. Drake? Subway, we're winners eat. Okay, some of that might be a lie. The thing is, while most movie tying games focus on recreating the events of the film in a more streamlined fashion, Beanox must have read the script to Amazing Spider-Man, hated it, and decided to just write their own sequel as the game picks up right after the film. The lizard is in prison because he forgot to pay for his PlayStation Plus, Gwen's dad is still dead, and Oscorp are continuing Kurt Connors cross-species research, creating these absolute abominations of nature. What actually happens at the start is Gwen Stacy, or whoever this woman is, can I see your ID please, subtly sneaks Peter into Oscorp so they can both investigate what's actually going on. Shockingly, you somehow manage to get into this highly guarded secret facility and coincidentally meet the new Oscorp CEO, Alistair Smythe voiced by Nolan North. I should probably go home and never do this again. And instead of, you know, instantly kicking you out, Smythe just gives you a tour of this highly secret lab showing off all his beautiful 
pets. Now obviously after finding out Oscorp is still creating these monsters, Gwen asks Smythe why exactly this is still going on. And like the absolute giga chad Alistair is, he's just like, funny. Another little fun fact is that these creatures are infested with all kinds of nasty viruses, which means if they somehow manage to escape, it could cause a city-wide pandemic. Which of course we don't want to happen. Don't worry though, I'm sure it's pretty much impossible for one of these guys to break out. Let's just uh, put some flex tape on that. So all the cross species obviously escape because Peter has literal bricks in his head, not realizing that because he's 50% spider, it's triggering the other cross species to behave more aggressively. This is the part where I get stung by a scorpion. Anyway, one of them takes a bite out of Gwen and you swing her to safety, putting her and the rest of the staff under quarantine, promising that you'll come back with a vaccine. Is anyone else getting deja vu? You leave Oscorp and with few options left, decide that your best plan is to go and get the lizard out of prison so he can help create a cure. However, instead of explaining any of this to the prison guards, Spidey just tries to break Kurt Connors out. Which causes a full on prison riot, because naturally the security guards attempt to apprehend you with one of them trying to use a taser, resulting in the whole security system getting destroyed. This is your fault, you gotta help me! I have to help you? <laughs> you tased me, bro! From here you get to grips with the combat system, fighting through the asylum, and also get a fantastic representation of mental illness. Eventually once you're done beating up the mentally ill though, you escape with Dr. Kirk Connors and take him back to your one room apartment, where you start to think up how you're going to create a cure, but not before you check the news. Oh, and before you do any of this, you fight a giant mech. At least it's not Uncle Ben dying again. <laughs> now at this point, you've probably started to realise that there's a severe lack of Andrew Garfield here. Or any of the original cast for that matter. See, the other Spider-Man tie-ins always featured the original cast voicing their own characters, which made those games feel a lot more authentic. Almost like you're actually playing parts of the movie. Despite the fact you obviously weren't. A car just hit that girl! She needs to go to the hospital! The pain! Make it stop. However here, instead of shoving Andrew into a sound studio, Spidey is voiced by Sam Rigel. And after a quick Google search, I've realised he's been in a, a lot of things, but most notably he voiced Donatello, the Ninja Turtle. Unfortunately, while I don't think Sam's acting is bad at all, it isn't particularly great either. When you gotta fight for me! You gotta fight! He can come across as incredibly overdramatic, to the point where I can't take a lot of the more serious cutscenes seriously. <laughs> like, the animations themselves feel so stiff and robotic, which paired with Rigel's hyper-dramatic anime acting, creates these fractured scenes where the voice and animations don't match up at all. In fairness, I think Rigel is doing his best with the material he's been given, which, trust me, isn't mm. great. You didn't try to kiss me, did you? I wanted to, but you were drooling, so... Like, a lot of Spider-Man's dialogue just assaults you with really forced references to things like Facebook. I'm going. Just don't expect a friend request anytime soon. The metaverse is about money. I mean, to be fair, this game did come out in 2012, the dark age of comedy. Yeah. Although I will say that while this game isn't exactly Oscar-nominated stuff, the voice acting is still nowhere near as bad as Web of Shadows. Where's Cage in his search party? Calm down! The civilians calm the down. down! Speaking of Web of Shadows, that game is open world. So is this one, meaning you can have fantastic interactions like this. Why, hello there. Hola. Okay, on the real, the open world here is... Alright. <laughs> Like, it definitely isn't perfect and can feel a little lifeless at times, but overall it isn't awful to look at and there's a variety of things to do, like taking photos of your adoring fans, gorgeous billboards, Norman's fresh drip, or even Gwen getting her neck snapped. Truly, this game was ahead of its time. I think what I like the most here though is that the city changes the more the pandemic gets worse, with people starting to wear masks as well as just breaking down, and you having to transport sick people to medical centres. Or, alternatively, you can just do what I did and start taking photos of them. You also get a chance to see how people in the city react to the ongoing chaos by scrolling through their tweets on the loading screens. With these updates starting out pretty harmless with my man talking about his sick new beats and a love story on par with Super Seducer, to them gradually becoming more panicked, with things like poor Mike going missing and people thinking the world's about to end. I have goosebumps, people. However, I see no updates about people fighting over toilet paper or suggesting that drinking bleach will cure the virus. 2 out of 10, unrealistic. As for the other stuff you can do while swinging around New York, you can act as a neighbourhood watch, stopping muggins and car theft, infiltrate Oscorp laboratories taking a few sneaky pics, play some extreme sports while Bruce Campbell films you, and you can collect a ton of comic books that you can read afterwards. Like this one. 
Oh, is, is this allowed? Now yes, while all that stuff sounds like it provides some lovely dopamine, the main thing you'll be doing in this game is of course web swinging, which makes me feel physically sick. But see, if you haven't noticed by now, the camera while you're swinging around is shoved right in between Spider-Man's perky ass cheeks. Like in literally every other Spider-Man game, the camera is set far back from Spider-Man, so you can have a good idea of where you are in the sheer scale of the environments as you plummet from the highest point in the map. However, here it's so horrendously close that it feels restrictive and claustrophobic, almost like you're swinging in the cardboard box. I get that this was done to make the game feel more cinematic, but fuck me, the motion sickness I get from playing this isn't worth it. Like if I wanted to be easily disorientated, I would just play Spider-Man VR. Other than that, the web swinging feels very similar to Beanox's previous Spider-Man games. In fact, it just feels like it's ripped straight from those games and inserted into this one. But the problem is, while that simple style of swinging worked in those more linear level-based games, it doesn't work in an open world. Like what am I swinging off of here? Did the sky open up so I could swing off God himself? They did add something new into the game though, that being Web Rush, a mechanic which slows down gameplay. This allows you to precisely aim where Spider-Man can shoot its webs over long distances, practically making it so you can just put the controller down and let the game play itself. Xbox, record that. Uh, what was I talking about again? Oh yeah, the story. So once you get Connors back to your apartment, it's a race against time to create the vaccine to help save Gwen and everyone else, with the amount of infected people increasing every single chapter. But in saying that, the game never actually feels like a race against time because you spend a large portion of your time fucking around in the open world playing basketball. Anyway, the plan here is to A, make a cure, and B, get rid of all the cross species roaming around New York. Because since they've gotten free, they've turned into a little bit of a problem, dragging people into the sewers and turning them into furries. Eventually, you do end up creating a vaccine after having a quick tussle with a giant rat and fighting an advanced Amazon delivery drone. You then quickly take the cure to Gwen, but Smythe decides to take it himself. However, being unable to handle the 7G waves emitted from the vaccine, he becomes so sick that his legs refuse to work. Naturally, Smythe isn't exactly happy with this, and after you escape Oscorp, he sends out another giant mech to a teach you a lesson. And it's at this point I'd like to mention that the majority of boss fights, whether of nanobots or Nat Geo, aren't good. In general, the combat here is just Arkham in a Spider-Man mask without, you know, the polish. But I do think it works decently here, whether you're fighting Oscorp's army of nanomachines or the various reptiles in the sewers, having some cool attacks which look incredibly comfortable. However, the combat here is a little more grounded than previous games, making it feel not as creative and unique as them, even with the various upgrades you have. Plus, there has been some weird choices made here, like remember health bars? Yeah, you don't need them. Beanox will just smear jam all over your screen like the funny shooting game. Have you ever heard of Among Us, Gregory? <laughs> Although despite all that, the combat system is decent enough until it comes to the boss fights when it all gets thrown straight out the window. I don't know what got lost in translation here, but the majority of these boss fights are pretty awful. Which is a shame because I actually really liked how the game reincorporated these classic Spider-Man villains, having them be animals that Oscorp experimented on from rhinos, scorpions, rats, and probably fish. <laughs> Fighting these things though is just, well, boring, because most fights can be broken down to Punch Bad Man, Dodge Bad Man, and Quick Time Bad Man. Rhino is by far the most egregious example of this. He's the first one you randomly encounter in a car park, and you'd probably expect this fight to be you dodging flying cars while you wait for a chance to clap him. But nope, you stand in front of a SWAT van, he runs into it, gives himself a mild concussion, punch punch punch, repeat five times, and congratulations, you're a zookeeper now. He doesn't even stay in the same spot after you beat him, he just fucking disappears when you're not looking. The big Metal Gear fights are a little better I suppose, based on the sheer scale of them, but besides that, there isn't anything memorable here other than the quick time events. I'm going to die! Actually, come to think of it, the only fight I actively enjoyed was with the Spider Slayers, because it utilizes the open world as you try your best to return them to Amazon HQ. Anyway, Kurt eventually realizes that it isn't 7G needs, but 8G, and luckily for him, Spider-Man is just full of the stuff. So with that in mind, he makes an actual cure with Peter's blood. You break back into Oscorp for like the third time, and after fighting through waves of killer androids, you manage to get the vaccine to the infected scientists, and of course Gwen. I also love how one of the scientists just injects himself with this potentially lethal vaccine, and is like, yeah, that'll do. But just when it seems like you're getting everything back to normal, you get hit with that second wave, in the form of Alistair Smythe, who is now an anti-vaxxer. Are you a doctor? 
No, not at all. He kidnaps Connors and uses him to lure you into a trap, informing you that he doesn't need your vaccine and instead has made his own, but with nano machines. He uses it on you, which goes about as well as you'd expect, <laughs> and you wake up to find out you no longer have any superpowers. This does actually lead into a pretty unique level where you have to try and escape from Smythe but without any of your powers, trying to avoid all the death bots roaming around the place to varying degrees of what success. The fuck is happening? After some trial and error, you leave Smythe's lab and make your way outside to see New York is isn't exactly in the best of conditions right now. Connors quickly gives you a call and tells you that he's went underground to keep making more of the antidote, so you head back into the sewers and make your way to Connors lab, reuniting with not Emma Stone. Now at this point I think it's pretty safe to say that everything seems a little fucked. Smythe is destroying the city, Peter has no powers, and now Connors decides it's a good idea to turn himself back into the lizard to try and save everyone, because that went so well last time. Peter then fucking dies, but thankfully gets resuscitated by Gwen. Clearly she's been playing a lot of Surgeon Simulator. Oh, no, 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 go. No! The electric shock from the defibrillators also destroys some of the nanobots that Smythe injected into him, giving Peter the big brain idea to electrocute himself. This leads into the end of the game where Peter gets a lift to Smythe's airbase, electrocutes himself, gets his powers back, and helps Lizard take down Smythe in another pretty underwhelming boss fight. But what's that? The Lizard turns evil again? Oh my god, I never seen this. You chase him back into the sewers, get jump scared, kiss Gwen with your mask on, and engage in a final boss fight which, in comparison to the other ones, is actually alright. Well done Beanox, here's a gold star to add to your collection. This of course ends with you curing Kurt Connors and then having an emotional chat about Lizard or something. I didn't pay attention cause oh my god, look at those abs. We then cut to Peter and Gwen, finally able to relax watching their favourite content creator. But breaking news, Alistair Smythe has broken out of prison, so Peter naturally wants to go get him, and Gwen's just like, nah, don't. And then the game abruptly ends. Uh, but hey, at least you unlocked this cool new suit. Ironically enough, after playing through all of this game, I think the best thing I can say about it is that it represents the film it's based on pretty accurately, having some really good ideas that essentially don't work out at all. I actually really like the game's story and how it reinvented some classic villains, but it doesn't do anything interesting with them. The boss fights made me severely upset, and I think Smythe is such an unbelievably generic antagonist that he would've been better if he was just an evil Nathan Drake. Flights in Bangkok. Also, it's cool that you have an open world to explore here and greet some lovely NPCs, but it ends up being completely pointless, because most levels just throw you inside where I can barely get through a door without climbing around it. Not to mention the fucking web swinging fried my brain. Although, with all that being said, I wouldn't say this game is awful, just painfully mediocre. And at least it's not the worst Spider-Man game ever made, because that prestigious award goes to the Amazing Spider-Man 2.